Pastor Rita was reading to me just this morning from the news that some newspaper in Salt Lake City is calling on the National Guard to make sure that anyone unvaccinated in the state of Utah stays in their homes. Um, hopefully the National Guard won't pay attention to the, whatever that newspaper is. But uh, we, this, these are crazy times. We're living in crazy times. But I'm confident that this is a time when the people of God can shine. And we can live the embodiment of the power of the gospel, which allows us to stand. I was talking with a businessman earlier this morning also who was talking about in his place of employment, all the turmoil that's going on about all kinds of things in his place of employment. And for the first time in all the years he's worked there, he is, and he used this illustration, which I think is so significant. He said, it's like the sand is falling away and the ones left standing are the believers. And I didn't even know they were believers before, and I'm coming to discover they are believers. I, I, I love that imagery. When the sand sifts away, May the people of God be standing. And that's the heart of the Apostle Paul for the believers in Thessalonica who were only one year old in the faith and had no New Testament and very likely did not have access even to an Old Testament. And all they had was the few weeks that the Apostle Paul was there and some of the Apostle Paul's assistants that stayed behind to help in Thessalonica after he left. But they're one year old and all hell is breaking loose around them. And they're still standing. And I want to jump right into 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So if you've got your Bible with you, if you've got a Bible in the seat in front of you, you may want to grab it because this may be too ambitious Rita will tell me afterwards if it was, but we're going to tackle the first chapter of Thessalonians. And I want to start off talking about the fact that I believe this first chapter, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, helps them identify who they are. And in the words of the who, in the famous Who Are You song, that's in a sense what I want to talk to you about this morning is that sense of identity that you have. Who, who are you? Because a lot of what we live and a lot of what we say and a lot of how we act flows out of who we, who we see ourselves as being. Who, who are you? So I thought, as I was getting ready for the message, I thought, you know, you see me in one aspect of my life. For the, for the most part, you see me as, as, a, as a pastor, and, and that's how you identify me. But I'm way more than just a pastor. I used to be a son until my mom and dad went to be with the Lord. I used to be a son, and I, have a whole, I had a whole sort of way I functioned as a son. When you're the son of a British Winston Churchill type personality, uh, you, you, you don't back talk, you, you, don't, you don't contradict um, your parents. I remember even as a kid having my dad comment on a 56 Ford that went by. And when I saw the taillights, I knew it was not a 56 Ford. I knew it was a 55 Ford because the 56 had a little bit of a, a peak on the, on the taillight and the 55s just had a round taillight. But there was no way you could say to dad, no, that's a 55, okay? Because you may regret having done that because you don't disrespect your elders. But now you could say, you know, Dad, when I looked at the taillights, uh, they didn't have that little thingy jiggy on the top. And, you know, I, I think maybe it was a 55 and he'd agree or not agree that, wa that was. But that's my role as a son. I will never forget standing on the deck of the SS Louise Likes, which was the freighter I came over here with on in 1966 because as all we could afford as a family to get me to Bible college. And so when I got on the freighter and my my dad and mom said goodbye to me on the deck. The last two things my dad said to me as, as they were getting ready to pull the gangplank up, he said, remember, son, that you're a child of God and remember you're a Rollins. My role as a son was to uphold the name of the family. 
I know I, I, I'm a brother. I'm not a very good brother. I have one sister left, Madge, and she's probably watching online. And I don't call her often enough at the facility she's living in right now. I don't see her nearly enough, although my excuse lately is that the facility won't let unvaccinated people in there. But, but I, I'm not a very good brother, Madge, but I have a role as a brother. Uh, I'm, I'm a husband. For 52 years, I've been a husband. I have a role as a husband to protect and to provide for my wife and my family and to love them and nurture them. That's, that's my role as a husband. I have a role as a father. And I know you may not see me functioning as a father, but I put two pictures in here just, just, just for the fun of it. Uh, this was me on, on Friday, my day off, because you see the Republic... Uh, services people have stopped collecting garbage and recycling in our area. I haven't had, we haven't had garbage pickup uh, since before Christmas. And so as you can imagine, the bags were piling up and the cardboard was piling up. And I have an old beater truck that you see parked out here in the church vacant lot that I just love driving because it's got dents all over it. And, and I don't care. You know, I, I'm very careful that my cars go, don't get dented, but this thing's so beat up. I love of driving it because I don't care. So on Friday, I got my raggedy clothes on and jumped in my old beater truck and went by the Hunts and picked up their garbage, went by the Wydells and picked up their garbage. And that's what a father does, right? I, I don't know if you've seen these commercials about that guy that's trying to help young, younger families not be like their dads. <laughs> I find those commercials so humorous because I'm exactly like that. My kids can absolutely set the timer when the temperatures drop below 20. They're going to get a call from me. Say, remember, get your faucet. One of your faucets dripping tonight so the pipes don't freeze, right? I'm a father. I'm also a grandfather to Ava and Sophia and to Reagan and Lucas, and that's a delight of my life. I'm a senior pastor to my colleagues who joined me in the pastoral ministry here at Westgate. I'm a pastor to all of you. I'm a pastor to my colleagues in the state of Washington to call them to prayer and repentance. I'm, I'm a friend to those who's, whom God has put in my life and blessed our lives with in close friendship. I'm a student. I always want to see myself as a student till you lay me to rest in forest lawn or wherever you can dig a hole for me when, when I'm done with this life. I, I never want to stop learning. I love learning. I'm a child of God. You see, all of these things kind of fuse together and you've got them too in your life. They all fuse together as you begin to walk out and understand who you are in all of these roles. They make up who you are. And listen, they make up how you feel about yourself. Because the research tells me if you have a good sense of self-identity, you have greater confidence in life. You're not defined by your successes and failures. You can learn from your failures and move on when you have a strong sense of self-identity because you don't feel like a failure identifies you forever. You can deal with it. You're not defined by your successes either. When you've, you've got greater confidence when you know who you are. You've got deeper integrity when you know who you are because you can act not just on what you think is right, but you can act on what you know is right. So you have greater integrity when you, when you know who you are. You have stronger relationships. I don't remember the name of the Christian family therapist who, who said sometimes marriage can be like a tick on a dog with two parties and one party is there just to draw, to suck whatever they can out of that. He said, the real problem you get into is when you get into a marriage where there are two ticks, no dog. <laughs> right? When you don't know who you are, you go into relationships purely for what you can get out of them. But when you know who you are, you can step into a relationship without the bondage of that kind of manipulation or ulterior motive. And you can just be there to minister and be ministered to in that friendship. 
So I believe there are reasons that the church in Thessalonica was standing strong in the midst of all of the chaos. And I believe it was because in the short time the Apostle Paul had worked with them, he had helped them identify who they were. And so I want to show you three things in this first chapter that clearly help the Thessalonians identify their new, their new identity. You see, they used to be pagan worshipers. They used to be idol worshipers. They used to worship at temples like Zeus and Apollo where there were male and female prostitutes who plied their trade as part of the worship of those temples. That was their identity. But now like Paul says to the Romans, that's or the Corinthians, that's who you were, but now you've been changed. That's who you were, but now you've been transformed. That's who you were, but now you've been justified. So if you look at chapter one and verse one of 1 Thessalonians, this letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica. Read this out loud with them, if you will. To you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the first of three simple points I want to leave with you that I believe will transform your life and I believe will help you to stay standing when everybody around you is collapsing and the sand around your feet is beginning to sift away through the troubles that you can remain standing if you know this one thing. You belong to God. That word belong comes from a Greek word that literally means to be one with, in union with, and it denotes, I love this from the Greek, it denotes a fixed location or landmark, which I believe is God. When you know you belong to God, he becomes a fixed landmark. I pray this doesn't happen, but let the, the principles of a representative republic, which we are, fall away around our feet and everything that we've gotten used to standing strong on as a citizen of the United States just drifts away. Let all of that collapse. The child of God still has a fixed landmark. We belong to God. We are made one with God through Jesus Christ. You are his son, you're his daughter, you're his family. And out of that identity of belonging, Paul sees three characteristics pop up in the life of the Thessalonican believers that flow out of knowing you belong. When you know you belong, you do faithful work. Let's read it together, verse eight. For by grace you've been saved. Sorry, this is not Thessalonians. For by grace you've been saved. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You are saved by grace to do the work of the kingdom. And you know you belong and that your belonging to God has settled into your life in a way that's transforming you when you do faithful work. Now, the Greek word there for work literally means duties, tasks, or labor that you are obligated to perform on moral or legal grounds. So I know this doesn't sit well with a lot of believers who are saved by grace to do nothing the rest of their lives. But in reality, you are saved by grace, Paul writes to the Ephesians, I just read it to you, for the good works that God has prepared beforehand that you would do. So if you're looking for evidence, do I really know I belong? Am I confident I belong to God? Start looking, are you doing the work of the kingdom? Wherever you are, whatever setting you are, at work, in the place of employment, in your neighborhood, with your friends, 
with your family? Are you doing the work of the kingdom? Because that's how Paul identifies these believers in Thessalonica as, as, as belonging to God because they do faithful work. Secondly is loving deeds. The Greek word for deeds in that next verse is different than the word for work. Deeds literally means difficult or laborious toil. In other words, you know you belong to God when you're doing work that nobody else wants to do. I know when you look at Brooklyn Tabernacle, you see a lot of incredible soloists who could sing nationally, and some of them at times do, but it's not like it's a litmus test, but I've heard Pastor Symbola say, if they're not willing to scrub the toilet, if suddenly the custodians are out and the bathroom needs cleaning, then they're not ready to sing on the platform. So what is the work that nobody else wants to do? Right? That happens around here a lot in different settings. And the one that comes to my mind right now is the work of Thanksgiving because everybody would rather be at home for Thanksgiving with their family. And so nobody wants to give up a family Thanksgiving. But in order to feed 12, 1,300 people from this region that have no Thanksgiving and don't have friends and don't have family, somebody's got to do the hard, laborious work that nobody else wants to do. Somebody's got to serve. And you know that you know you belong when you do faithful work and when you do loving deeds, those things that nobody else wants to do. And then thirdly, when you have enduring hope, Paul says in verse, uh, in verse three, enduring hope. The word, we, we, sorry, I'm, the, the third evidence of what it means to belong is from Thessalonians, the enduring hope. And the word enduring, translated enduring, literally means the power to withstand hardship and stress. This is why, folks, this word from Thessalonians is so important to us right now. Because there has never been a time when the Christian church in America even though we don't have persecution like they do in other parts of the world, but there's never been a time when in your private life and your work life and your family life, there's never been a time when we've had to endure this kind of hardship and stress. How do you come through it with enduring hope? The word for hope literally means the, an expectancy regarding the future and a trust in the ultimate outcome. I have expectancy that Jesus is Lord. I have expectancy in the ultimate hope of the gospel that whatever happens to me in this life, I have a home that Jesus has gone to prepare for me that where he is there, I may be also. I have a city I'm going to whose builder and founder is God. I have a hope that doesn't depend on the Republican Party. I have a hope that doesn't depend on who's in the White House. And do those things concern me? Yes. Are those things the things that I believe Christians need to be engaged in? Absolutely. But I have a hope that transcends those things. And that's what happens when you know you belong. It's why we give so many invitations here for people to come to experience Jesus as Lord of their lives because when you know you belong, you can go through stuff and have enduring hope when you know you belong. So, so one of the things you've got to leave here this morning as a, as a marker of your identity is I belong to God. I belong to God. No matter what battle you face, he's there with you. He never leaves you or forsakes you. His Holy Spirit is there to strengthen you and equip you and empower you. I belong to God. I remember having a fight in sixth grade with Mike Hawthorne, who had been left behind a grade because of his problems and he was quite a bit taller than the rest of us and he was making life miserable for everybody. And finally, I tackled him in the, 
in the playground one day because I was sick and tired of him belittling and bullying everybody else. And he beat the snot out of me. I went home with blood on my shirt. I had a bloody nose. Uh, I was just a mess. And I didn't know this was going to happen. But the next day at school, he was on my case all day long. I didn't know this was going to happen, but my dad came to the fence to pick me up from school that day. He must have guessed what was happening. And I'm walking out to school, out of school with my satchel and and Mike Hawthorne was walking right behind me, just goading me, well, you know, because he could beat me up so easily. I guess he thought he'd like to do it again. And then he saw my dad. Right? I didn't say anything. I didn't say neener, neener. I didn't say anything like that at all. But when, when Mike Hawthorne, it's funny how those names stick with you, right? When he saw my dad, he kind of slunk back into the background and I was, I didn't say this, I didn't think about it at the time, but I was going to say, I belong to him. I belong to him. And when things get tough in your life, the Holy Spirit is right there and he brings Jesus with him. He brings the Father with him. That's why Jesus said, it's better for us that he go away because he sends the Holy Spirit and he brings Jesus to us in a way that, that couldn't happen if Jesus was limited to a physical body in a physical location. So you can say to the enemy as he comes against you, I belong to him. I belong to him. Second thing, you're chosen by God. Oh, child of God, I can only trust the Holy Spirit to get this into you. You're chosen by God. Look at verse four. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his people. I got another crazy story about being chosen that I know I've shared here before, but I've never been very fast athletically. In fact, I've been probably pretty slow most of my life. But they loved me playing rugby because I played in the scrum in rugby. I was a front support in, in rugby, and I held the hooker up. I know that doesn't go over well in this country to say that, but... <laughs> But that was the person that played next to me whose job it was to hook the ball. And so I've always had beef, so I was okay as a rugby player. But when the kids in our neighborhood played cricket, which required you to run fast or catch, run and catch, or you play, we played soccer, which required you to run fast, nobody ever wanted me. Right, And I don't know how if you've been in that kind of, but I remember I have a vivid memory as a kid being in some sort of sandlot soccer game and the two best athletes were choosing up their team and I'll get Smith, he, I'll, get, I'll get to, and, and I'd be the last one there, right? I probably need counseling for that. <laughs> and see, it gets worse. One of the one of the captains would say, you get Rollins. And then, the, like, no, I had him last time. <laughs> That's part of my childhood. Can you imagine what it's like to be chosen? Can you imagine what it's like to be wanted? And Paul says, we know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you. Listen to me. You are deliberately selected. Now, if that doesn't help your sense of self-esteem, I don't know what will. But not just by some cricket captain. It's a stupid game, anyhow. <laughs> Goes on for weeks. Not just by some cricket captain but chosen by the God of the universe. Jim, God chose you. I remember being with you down at Boeing Field at an air show that you brought your airplane to, and you and Mary Lou didn't even walk with the Lord in those days, but God had his hand on you, and people, he brought people into your life that shared the gospel. I remember coming to your house with you sitting a few months after that on the front porch with the word of God open, struggling to read, walk through the word of God. You're chosen. You're chosen by God. And I know, listen to me, I have to do a little departure here. I know there are certain people in a certain theological persuasion that, that have the theology that God chooses arbitrarily some people to be saved and some people to be damned. 
That's part of a, a theology structure of sort of an extreme reformed Calvinistic theology that called the election, that God elects people to be saved and other people to be damned. I don't believe that's for a second because that's so contrary to whosoever will may come. Plus, one of my favorite verses in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, for those, read it with me out loud, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined. In other words, chose to be conformed to the image of his son. That is a key word, those he foreknew. Here's how I've explained it down through the years that I've pastored. God, who is not bound by time, knows our choices and decisions ahead of time. And even though we are in time and have free will, he's not coercing anything out of us, because he's not bound by time and sees the future, he knows the choices that you're going to make and will orchestrate and arrange the people that came to you and Mary Lou, Jim, in your family and outside that began to share the gospel. He orchestrates and arranges because those he foreknew, he chose. Listen, I don't want to get into a theological debate here because there is no debate. We're a Wesleyan, more Wesleyan Pentecostal here in our theology, but we absolutely believe everyone has free choice to serve, to know and serve Jesus Christ so that everyone who's here who is born again can say with confidence, not only do I belong, I've been chosen. You've been chosen by God. And those who are chosen, Paul goes on to elaborate, are identified by three things. Please tell me afterwards if I'm just giving too much stuff at you, but I'm almost done here. But those who know they are chosen are identified by three things. One, with revelation from God that comes with power. Verse 5a, for because, for because when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. Those that God has chosen experience the power of God. Maybe not, maybe not seeing people necessarily get, come out of wheelchairs, although God absolutely does that, but it's the power of God to save and transform. And those who are chosen are intersected by the power of revelation. And we can't teach you that. We can't catechize you in that. We can't lead you in that. That's only the Holy Spirit can take the word and suddenly, bam, the word hits you right between the eyes. And a minute ago, you didn't know you were a sinner, but suddenly you know you need forgiveness and salvation. That's the power of revelation. Secondly, people who are chosen have the Holy Spirit give them full assurance of the truth. Look at verse 5b. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. That's the confidence you can have as you read books, Christian books, as you listen to speakers. And I've had this happen to me. My family gets irritated with me because a speaker will be going along that we're watching on TV and sudden, everything will be great and suddenly there'll be something that makes me go straight for my Bible. I'm thinking, ah, I'm not sure about that. And it irritates them. You know, They just say, come on, Dad, spit out the bones and keep eating the meat. No, I want to, I want to pause right there. Uh, it's called discernment. It's what the Holy Spirit gives every believer. So you don't have to worry about being taken in by, by the phony. He gives you full assurance that what we said was true. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit will give you joy. Joy! I know you saw my post but my joy was a little depleted until the blue sky came out on, it was Friday, wasn't it? I said to Pastor Rita, after I did the garbage run, make us some sandwiches. We're gonna go park at sunset and watch the ferry come and go. And I, my heart was just filled with joy because I could see the jolly sky, <laughs> which I haven't seen since October the 19th. 
You received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. Oh man, you got this, child of God. You got this. You got this because, because you belong. You got this because you are chosen. And then here's the last thing Paul says, and I'll close with this. Uh, you, you know you've got this and you've got this identity that you belong to God when you live your life like an example for other people. Listen, listen to this. These Christians in Thessalonica are one year old. They didn't have, they didn't have alpha curriculum. They didn't have basic training. They, they didn't have preaching. They, they, occasionally, I'm sure they did, but, but you know, they had very little except the Holy Spirit and the few words that Paul had left with them and the leaders that were doing their best to follow the instruction Paul and, and Timothy had left behind. And yet listen to what Paul says about them. In this way, you imitated us and the Lord. And as a result, you have become an example. You know, before I go any further, I gotta, I've, I've shared this with you before, but I got to say it again. A few study leaves back, I read a book called The Patient Ferment by a Dr. Alan Kreider, K-R-E-I-D-E-R. -E and he's a, his church, a church historian at the end of his life, has spent his life reading all the first century documents of the church. And he was, he was surprised that in all of the documents of the early church that he read, circular letters that were sent around to the churches, uh, uh, transcriptions of sermons, all of that first century stuff that he's studied all of his life. He never read a, a message or a podcast or heard a podcast or anything on the subject of evangelism or you ought to be winning souls or you need to evangelize, nothing. And yet his conclusion based on the history is that was a season when more per, per capita, more people came to Christ than at any other time in church history, including the present. And he concluded from the history books, he's concluded that the reason people came to Christ was that people that came to Christ were so transformed and their lives were so radically different that their friends and their neighbors and their work associates had their jaw on the ground and were left asking the question, what in the world has happened to you? And that opened the door for the, for the relaying of the truth of the gospel. We do, we do a good job in America with the truth of the gospel, but so few Christians are living an example that for the most part, the world doesn't want, want what we got. In fact, Kreider says, most of our evangelism today, this is like a sword in my heart, most evangelism today is answering questions the world isn't even asking. So we need to revert to the kind of identity that causes us to live an example. Let's go on. To all believers, you've become an example to all believers in Greece, throughout Macedonia and Achaia, which is down in Athens, and now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God, and we don't need to tell them about it. Three things that identifies their being an example. One, they welcome God's servants, for they kept talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us. People who know who they are in God are open in their hospitality because they welcome, especially the servants of God, but they have an open and welcoming lifestyle. When you know who you are, you're not intimidated by strangers and you can open your life and welcome strangers. It's the first sign that you're living an example. Second, you turn away from idols. Second part of them being an example to serve the living and true God, verse 9b. And lastly, and they speak of how you are looking forward 
to the coming of God's Son from heaven. Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, he's the one who's rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. We have lost sight. One of the reasons I'm excited about being in Thessalonians is we're gonna get to talk about end times and about tying some of those prophecies together because we are living in the end times. But we live in them looking forward to the coming of the Lord. Not as an escapist, not because beam me up, Scotty, I want, get me out of here. But recognizing that we're not citizens of this world, we're citizens of a heavenly city whose builder and maker is God. And while we're called to steward our citizenship in this country, God calls us by the Spirit to be anticipating the fact that this world is not our final home. That there is coming a day, just like my dad used to preach, when the trumpet will sound and those who were dead in Christ will rise first. I'm getting ahead of 2 Thessalonians. And we who were alive and remain will be caught up in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord forever. We've got to live. The only example we can be to our fellow man right now and our fellow believers even right now is that we're not caught up as desperate escapists in this turmoil we're in right now because we are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God and Jesus is coming back. He's going to catch up into the air those of us who are alive and remain and then judgment will begin. I don't know if you saw the news about this horrific explosion of the volcano in the vicinity of Tonga but we saw a satellite picture of it in the news last night. Just, you know, we're seeing increasing numbers of these natural disasters, but that's nothing compared to when the judgment of God comes. So if you're watching us online or if you're in the service and you have yet to give your life to Jesus Christ, give your life to him today. Do it right now at the end of the service when we have our pastors and prayer counselors come up. Come and talk to one of them about what it's like to walk with Jesus Christ. But get your life and your identity fixed in him so that when the sand starts sifting away from the things you've been used to standing on, the believer will remain standing because we've got this.